It's the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 142. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here each and every week to take your health to the next level. This week, our featured guest is Dr. Bruce Lipton, a pioneer in the new biology and an internationally recognized leader in bridging science and spirit. A cell biologist by training, Bruce was on the faculty of the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and later performed groundbreaking stem cell research at Stanford University. He's a best-selling author of The Biology of Belief and received the 2009 prestigious Goy Peace Award in honor of his scientific contribution to world harmony. It was such an honor speaking with Bruce, and we can't wait to hear what you guys think of this one. Speaking of hearing from you guys, I'm going to share an iTunes review right now by Mickey Diaz, a five-star review titled Awesomeness. Since the first time I heard the podcast with my wife, we've been hooked. Thanks, Jesse and Marnie, for giving us the day-to-day tools and weekly guests to take our health to the next level. For Marnie's smoothie recipes, Jesse's love for coconut, Josh Catalis's impressive tips and great elixir creation, Josh Axe's bone broth, to Robin Chutkin's explanation on how to keep our microbiome healthy. Every week, you guys provide us with quality information. We're expecting a baby, and we can't wait to apply all these healthy tips so the baby can reach ultimate health since day one. Thanks, Jesse and Marnie. Mickey, thank you so much for the kind words. We really appreciate it. We're so excited that your baby's going to be applying this awesome information right since the beginning, and uh, we wish you guys all the best. As always, guys, we love hearing your reviews. It's just so important to Jesse and I to hear the feedback, hear how you guys are experiencing the podcast. So if you haven't left a review yet, go ahead and do that. UltimateHealthPodcast.com slash iTunes. Let us know what you think. We want to hear it. And you might be lucky enough that we'll get to read it on the show. So now I'm going to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Sun Warrior. And today I'm going to highlight the Liquid Light. So Liquid Light is the vitamin and mineral boost that you can add to your water. Great way to upgrade your water. This is something you can take before, during, or after a workout. It's called fulvic acid. And this helps to detoxify your cells and helps to just nourish your body. So if you haven't tried Liquid Light yet, get your hands on it. Add it to your water. Add it to a smoothie. Sip on it throughout the day. A great way to get a nutrition boost. As a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Sun Warrior products. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. And for listeners in the US and Canada, bundle that order together, spend $100 or more, and you'll get free shipping. So go and take advantage of this amazing deal and get your hands on some liquid light right now. So now I'm going to give a shout out to our other show sponsor, Core Chair. And Core Chair, as you guys may have heard when we talked about it before, not only is incredible for your posture, for your back, reducing back pain, but it's also been shown to be helpful to boost your metabolism. There was a study done by the Mayo Clinic showing that movements, small movements on the core chair every day can up your metabolism by 20%. So this is something quite amazing because just while you're sitting at your desk during the day, just those little, small, subtle movements make a difference. And we all want to find different ways to boost our metabolism and the core chair can do it. So if you don't have a core chair yet, I highly recommend it. I love it. I love sitting on it during the day. I don't even feel like I'm sitting. So take advantage. Try out what active sitting is all about and get yourself a core chair. As a listener of our show, you get 10% off your core chair purchase. And for listeners in North America, you get free shipping. Core chairs are amazing. Marnie and I use ours on a daily basis and love them. Go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash core chair and get your core chair today. So now back to our show with Bruce Lipton. I am so excited for you guys to hear this episode. Bruce Lipton was first introduced to me way back when I went to school at the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. We did a course on the psychology of disease. And this was groundbreaking at the time for me because I never really made the connection between the mind and body and how certain physical problems that we can have and diseases can really come down to the mind. Such a powerful interview. So now we're going to get into a couple of things that we highlight in the show. We discuss the experience Bruce had in second grade that set the course for the rest of his life. We get into how only 1% of disease is associated with genetics. Bruce talks about how we have two minds, the conscious and subconscious, and how 95% of your life is controlled by the subconscious mind. And this was programmed during childhood. We discuss how the pictures you have in your mind create the chemistry in your body. And we also talk about how we are all the creators of our personal worlds and collectively we are creating the world we all experience. Such a profound interview. 
Dr. Bruce Lipton is such an energetic, awesome guy to listen to. You guys are going to love this. So without further ado, here we go with Dr. Bruce Lipton. Hello, Bruce, and welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Jesse, Marnie, I am so happy to be here with you because um, I, I'm excited. The The world is moving along just beautifully. Beautifully? Well, yes, if you understand what's happening, the strange weirdness that's out there is, is the most important part of our survival. So uh, maybe we'll talk about that. All right. Well, we're going to talk about a lot of things, but what I want to start off with, Bruce, is a story. You're seven years old. You're in Mrs. Novak's second grade classroom, and you're looking through the microscope. So tell us about this experience and how it set the course for the rest of your life. Well, it was interesting, number one, that remember, second grade, I'm a little kid and everything in the world is really big. And then I look into this microscope and see something you can't even see. It's so small that it's like, wow, for a kid, that was like another world. It was a whole new world. And when I started looking, I mean, I was excited because uh, these things were moving around. They had these amoebas and paramecia. And it was like, wow, there, there's a whole world of stuff going down there. So for uh, a kid in second grade, this is like, wow, it's like Star Trek. Uh, and and looking at this world uh, and, you know, peering into it, it it's just a, a juxtaposition position of size that in second grade was like totally amazing. But when I watched these cells, the first thing I started noticing about the cells is that they, they weren't like a pinball, you know, just bouncing from one side to the other side. Uh, you know, uh, an amoeba would crawl over here and spend some time over here and then crawl over there and spend some time over there. And so it was like when I looked at them in, in my mind, it was like, oh, they're like little people in there. And that really got, you know, started my whole thing. I actually spent uh, that summer when school got out, uh, I had a microscope that my parents bought me and I wanted to take a micrograph and I spent, God, I don't know how many dollars developing film, uh, holding a camera above the microscope and not seeing it, what I could see in the microscope. But by the end of the summer, I figured it out how to hold the camera back away from the eyepiece. And, uh, you know, so I, I must have cost a hundred bucks back then, but it was my first photo micrographs. And I ended up uh, in graduate school doing electron microscopy and going deeper into the cell and, and uh, you know, living inside of cells. And every time I turned on that electron microscope, it was always a joy for me. I, I always thought, my God, they're, they're paying me to do this research. And I would pay them to come in here and use this microscope because it, it is Star Trek in the reverse, going down and down and down into the smallest realms and looking at the molecules of life and, and seeing these images that are so alien and yet they're us. There are cells. It was an exciting experience. And then my communication with cells via my research, they taught me stuff that blew my mind. And actually, uh, the stuff that the cells taught me, I, I already I was teaching medical students at that point, and I had tenure in the medical school. And yet, when the cells were revealing uh, an understanding of life at that level, it was so conflicting with what I was teaching in the school there was a point I said, I cannot go into that classroom and teach any more medical students that genes control life because the cells revealed a completely different story. And uh, that was back in 1970. And I saw uh, that story that the cells revealed to me is a story that is the leading edge of science called epigenetics. Uh, uh, the science of epigenetics wasn't even named until the 90s. And I was already receiving from the cells a story that was epigenetics in 1970. So it's like 20 years uh, before the mainstream even caught on. It was like, oh, wow. <laughs> And um, a lot has come down and uh, a lot of learning from, from the cells. So uh, I feel like a very happy student of cell biology. Well, it's very exciting times here. Ten-year anniversary of your book, The Biology of Belief, took place at the end of last year. Congrats on that. And Thanks. And really interesting in the book, you talk about how you almost renamed the book The Biology of Belief and Hope, which is really interesting. And I'd love to hear... Where does the hope come in? And yeah, just share what your hope is with all yeah. the ongoings of what's happening in the world today. This is very important, and I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this because so many people read the newspaper, get online, see what's the story, watch the TV, and the news coming down is like, oh my God, what the hell is happening here? And if you don't understand it, it, it could be a very scary 
uh, uh, view of what's going on in the world. And I'd like to offer another insight that I think is, you know, from what I learned from the cells. And uh, what we're experiencing right now is an evolutionary paradigm, a jump in evolution. But to go from where we are to where we're going uh, requires that we actually disassemble the way we've been living as a civilization on this planet for a very simple reason. We're not sustainable. Uh, the way we use the Earth's resources and destroy the environment and, and you know, uh, adding all our chemistry and all the kind of stuff that we do to try to control life, we have set off what is called the sixth mass extinction of life on this planet. That, what this means is five times in the history of this planet, life was thriving and some event happened and then from 50 to 90% of life got wiped out. This is five different events. The last big one was the dinosaurs, very lush world of dinosaurs and all that, and some event, boom, and then the dinosaurs are gone and the world is shaken up. But the last one, uh, that dinosaur one, is attributed to a comet or asteroid hitting the planet and upending the ecosystem and, and causing this mass extinction. Previous ones are attributed to uh, geological activity, like massive numbers of earthquakes and volcanoes simultaneously upsetting the ecosystem. So point five times life is thriving, some event happens, and from 50 to 90 percent of life gets wiped out. Today, science has recognized, and it didn't happen today, we've known it for a while, but the public uh, is, is just not being made aware of it, is that we are in the sixth mass extinction right now. There's always a loss of species. Uh, you always lose a few species uh, per year. That's just the way life is. But today, the loss of species, and this is a number that's like mind-boggling, is 1,000 times greater than the background loss of species. In other words, something is upsetting the, the apple cart so much that we're 1,000 times more species are going extinct per day or year than in a regular time. This is now then being classified as we are in what is called the six mass extinction. We're wiping out uh, massive portions of the biosphere with human behavior. In fact, geologists uh, who give the Earth different ages call the current age right now the Anthropocene. And Anthrop, <laughs> that precursor part, is human. And it says human activity is changing the geology of the planet. <laughs> well, it's changing the biology of the planet, too. We are in a mass extinction. And the most important fact is uh, science has recognized the cause of today's mass extinction is human behavior. Basically, it says the way we're living on the planet, the way we're treating each other, and the ecosystem is destructive of everything. Uh, the web of life is uh, starting to have a lot of tears in it, and people don't realize if the web of life starts to crash, so do humans. <laughs> we are the web of life. And so uh, the world is facing a mass extinction, and that includes us. As a matter of fact, just to give you like how, how much radical change has happened on this planet. For example, there was a survey of the uh, animal wildlife on this planet in 1970, and a recent survey revealed that 62% of the animals are lost since 1970. In other words, we have less than half the number of animals on the planet today than were here in 1970, and the number is going fast, and even to the extent that it is recognized by science, there will be no fish in the ocean by 2048, and that's conservative. It'll probably happen before that. Uh, all of this is uh, a, a scientific, uh, it's not alternative facts, <laughs> it's real fact that um, we are facing an extinction and science has recognized human behavior is responsible. Simply, we're living outside the bounds of the ecosystem and the world in which we live. The only way out of this problem is to change the way we are living and to build a new civilization, the one that we can thrive into the future. A sustainable civilization means we profoundly have to change the foundation of our way of life. It's that that's the problem. You can't, you know, add a new floor and say, oh, we fixed the, the, the way of life. No, we, we have to tear it apart. And then I come to the minute right now and I say everything's on schedule. Uh, the president of the United States is essentially tearing apart a nation and causing a shaking of the whole foundation. He's not the hero in the story. He's the initiator uh, because there's a simple point. Crisis precipitates evolution, meaning if you hit the wall, 
Well, then you can't keep going that way. You have to change. And we've hit the wall and we're in a process of the wall has to come down and we're making change. And you're seeing it in the public. The public is starting to get together and forming a voice as a community, a collective saying, no, we want a better way of life on this planet. So uh, we're provoking an evolution right now. When you see things falling apart, why is it good news? And the answer is quite simple. If it stayed exactly the same, pretty bad news because the extinction is rapidly approaching. So the only way out is to make change. And lo and behold, here we are in this process. And with the awakening of consciousness and an awakening of our understanding of the ecosystem, an awakening of who we are uh, biologically, spiritually, uh, this awakening is providing the foundation of a new civilization. And so it's an amazing moment when you look out the window, you see it falling apart, and you really have to say, wow, that's really good because it stayed the same bad news. <laughs> and so the coming apart is the opportunity for civilization to evolve. And, and that's an evolution. And it, it's not a physical evolution. It's an evolution of consciousness, changing the way we respond to each other and the world. And, and this is the wake up call. I sorry, I went on long about that. But it's so vital in what is going on in the world today. No, and it's good to hear just how excited you are about it. And what's so amazing, Bruce, is that you've been studying this for so long. You've been looking deep at, at genes, at cells, and you've had this deeper understanding of knowing that there's so much more that, that we don't know. And now we're seeing this take place in the real world. So where do we start? We're seeing this consciousness change. We're starting to understand that our beliefs make a difference and they have an impact not only on our genes, but on our behaviors. So what does this look like? How is this coming into play? Well, in the old days, being an oldster, when we were undergoing what was the revolution, the hippie days, you know, that, that, that golden period for a little bit, that, that it was a wake up period where all the things that we're dealing with today were the topic of then as well, uh, the environment and taking care of each other and loving each other and uh, all the beautiful things that we want right now and we need right now were part of that hippie thing. It'll, it disappeared. There's reasons in my book and it talks about that, but it's reemerging right now. So let's give an important quote from that time period. And, uh, and the idea is this, before you go out and clean up the world, first clean up your own backyard. And what this really means is this, we're moving into a higher state of consciousness. That's what evolution is all about. It's not physical, it's consciousness. And we've all been limited by consciousness uh, programming because we didn't know we were programmed. A lot of people have seen the movie The Matrix. It's, they perceive it as science fiction. The fact is, no, The Matrix is an absolute documentary. Every one of us has been programmed. Uh, that was a requirement. That's not a negative thing. The negative part of it is the bad programming. Uh, we require programming for a very simple reason. Uh, um, an infant is born into a family and has to become a member of the family and a member of the community. Well, there are rules. Every culture has rules. And, and it can't be genetic. Rules change all the time, so I can't make genes. So basically, as we come into the world, the first thing we have to do is download behavior of how to be a member of a family and how to be a member of a community so we all participate collectively and wholly together. So the first seven years of a child's life the brain is operating at a lower vibrational frequency, and th that uh, the vibrational frequency is what we measure in EEG, electroencephalographs, where they put wires on your head and read brain function. The vibrations of a child before seven are a lower vibration, and they're in a state of hypnosis. And, and the reason is simply this. It's, it, it, I give an analogy to buying an iPod. Uh, old guy, me goes in, buys an iPod, put all the money down, come out of the Apple store, open up the box, take the iPod out and push play and nothing happens. And the old guy goes, what the hell? I just paid for a lot of money. There's nothing playing. And some little seven year old kid next to me looks up and says, Hey, mister, before you can uh, play this thing, you have to download the programs. And I was like, Oh, before we can be conscious, we have to have programs to operate consciousness. And so nature creates seven years of download time where we observe and it's hypnosis. It's a record. We record other people's behavior in our subconscious mind. And those are programs of how to behave, how your father behaved. Uh -huh, I'm going to learn that how my mother behaved. I'm going to learn that and how my siblings and my community. Why? Because I have to participate. So I say, great, we all got programmed. 
Unfortunately, psychologists will tell us 70% or more of the programs that we got in that first seven years are disempowering, self-sabotaging, and limiting. Most of these programs we got were critical of ourselves, you know, because parents were criticizing us to grow up and, you know, be better. And they'd act like a coach and say, okay, you know, you can do better. Who do you think you are? That's not good enough, you know. And they didn't mean that forever. They just were like, you know, putting a needle in you to, as a kid, to do something, to do better. But unfortunately, that first seven years uh, is when the downloading is going. Consciousness isn't really working. The child's just recording. So, the child doesn't understand the parent when the child says, uh, parent says, oh, you don't deserve that. It's a, it doesn't mean you don't deserve stuff. The child is in hypnosis. What does it record? I do not deserve. I do not deserve. And the function of the mind is to take the programs that we get and make reality using the program. So we're operating from a program. The problem is, as I said, most are negative and self-destructive. Uh, and why is that relevant? Because if we look at health issues on this planet, here's a very important fact. Only 1% of disease is even associated with genetics. Over 90% of the illness in this world, which is in a healthcare crisis, over 90% of healthcare issues have nothing to do with genetics and everything to do with lifestyle and, and our perception of the world, our beliefs about the world. Uh, because we understand now the genes don't control things. That's what almost everybody out there is programmed with. Almost every one of us got programmed. Genes turn on, genes turn off, and genes give us our characteristics, be they physical, emotional, behavioral. And I go, okay, this is what the cells taught me back in 1970. The genes don't control anything. It's the environment in which the cells are placed that control the expression of the cell I had genetically identical cells in three different petri dishes, genetically identical, but changed the environment, the composition of the culture medium, the culture medium serum. And I say, I change it a little bit in three dishes. They're all genetically identical cells in each dish, but they end up, one dish forms muscle, another dish, the cells form bone, a third dish, the cells form fat cells. And the conclusion is that I saw in 1970, oh my God, genes aren't controlling the fate of the cells. They all have the same genes. It was the environment. And then to make it now in one big jump, although it's taken me years, the big jump is this. Uh, that's cells in a Petri dish re responding to culture medium. And I go, when you look at your human body and you see a single entity, that's a, a misperception. You're made out of 50 trillion cells. The cells in your body are the living entity. You, uh, whether it's Marnie or Jesse or Bruce, that's a name for a community of 50 trillion cells under your skin is this gigantic community of 50 trillion amoebas working in harmony to create your life. And I say, oh, so a body, this is the funny part, the body is a skin-covered Petri dish with 50 trillion cells inside. I said, what about the growth medium? He said, when I make growth medium in a laboratory, what recipe do I use? And the answer is, whatever organism I get the cells from, I look at their blood and then try to make a synthetic version of it. So culture medium is the equivalent of blood. I go, wait a minute. In a plastic culture dish, the genetics of the cell are controlled by the information in the culture medium, which is the equivalent of blood. And I say, in your body, your 50 trillion cells are in a skin-covered Petri dish, and they're controlled by the composition of your blood, your culture medium. And then we take two steps, and we're, I've, I finally stop talking. <laughs> uh, step uh, Next one is, well... The chemistry of your blood, your culture medium, is controlling the genetics of your cells. Yes, that's true. And I say, then what controls the chemistry of your blood? And you say, the nervous system is the coordinator, the conductor that puts the chemicals in to coordinate all the functions and sends it to the body through the blood. And I go, great, last question, and this is the big one. So, what chemicals should the brain put in the blood? And here's the amazing conclusion. Whatever picture you have in your mind about the world, about you and your life. That's like a picture. And the, that's in your mind. The brain reads that picture and breaks it up into chemistry and releases it to the body so your body becomes a complement of the picture. It's like paint by numbers in reverse. 
paint by numbers, you get an outline with numbers in it, but the numbers represent different colors. And when you put the colors together into the numbers, voila, you are Picasso. There's this great picture you just painted. I go, life is paint by numbers in reverse. You start first with the picture in your mind. The brain takes a, an analysis of that picture and breaks it down into chemistry that will complement that picture. And that chemistry is released into the body and that controls our genetics and our behavior. So a simple observation is this. If you open your eyes and you see someone you love, the mind experiencing love and the feeling of love releases wonderful chemicals in your body, such as uh, dopamine, the pleasure of love, oxytocin, uh, the bonding that bonds you to that loved one, a uh, growth hormone. When you're in love, your brain is releasing growth hormone and that's why people in love are so healthy and vibrant, they glow. I say the chemistry of the culture made him is affected by the picture of love. And then I say, same person opens her eyes, sees something that scares them. And the first thing is this, none of those chemicals I just talked about are released by the brain. Now, stress hormones, inflammatory agents, those are released by the brain. Changes your biology and your genetics as soon as that stuff goes on. So I'm sorry for the long run on it, but it comes down to simply this, is the way we see the world in our mind is how we create our body. And all of a sudden, it's like, we're creating it. Well, it's an unbelievable way to look at the world. And, you know, when we're talking about love and the things we want to hear, it makes perfect sense. I guess where this has come up, you know, in terms of uh, controversy or complications is when it talks about disease, right? Like when people are manifesting potentially their own illnesses due to their thoughts and beliefs. And I know that this is a huge area that you talk about. And people don't make this connection, right? Because they are often no, being victim to their own situations. That's the program they got. Because if then you go in, you say, I've got this illness. I got a heart problem. Oh, what did we learn in school? The heart's made out of cells and it works as an organ. And the doctor knows how to take care of this organ and you don't. So I got a heart problem. I go to the doctor, <laughs> you know, because I don't have anything to do with it. It's like the genes did this and all that. And it turns out, no, that again, 90% of cardiovascular disease has nothing to do with a body not working normally. In fact, the expression is a perfect expression of a vision of someone who's having a problem in their world, turning that problem into the chemistry, which in turn adjusts the genetics. And all of a sudden you got a heart problem. <laughs> it's like, wow, what a coincidence. It's like, no, you put the chemistry in to create the heart problem. You know, here's an interesting one. We always talk about genetics uh, of cancer. Well, it turns out less than 10% of cancer is even hereditarily based. That 90% of cancer is due to lifestyle and, and, and perception. And I say, well, what do you mean? I say, here's the research. They looked at kids who were adopted into families where there was cancer running in the family. And they followed the fate of these kids. And guess what? The adopted kids get the same family cancer at the same probability of any of the natural kids in the family. Issue? The adopted kid came from completely different genetics. The linear cancer in the family it was not based on the genetics. It was based on the programming, and that's how people can recover from cancer, by changing uh, how they respond to life, their beliefs and their perceptions of life. You created it with perceptions. You can change your perceptions, and, and everything will come back to normal. So we're living in a time of wake up. It says the world's in a lot of trouble, but if you feel you're, that you're a victim in this world of what's going on in your life, you have no control over your health, your relationships, your job, and all that. And you feel like, I, I in my mind, I, I want all the success. And I go, well, that's true, everybody, because the mind, there's two parts, the conscious and the subconscious. The conscious part is who we are, the unique individual we are, our spiritual foundation, so to speak. Consciousness is you. It's creative wishes and desires. So when you wake up in the morning and you say, what do you want? I want to be healthy. I want a great job. I want a great relationship. I say, good. This is thinking from the conscious mind. But the issue is their second mind is more powerful. And that's the subconscious one, the one that got programmed in the first seven years. I say, so I wake up in the morning with my conscious mind engaged going, yep, this is what I'm going to go seek today. But what we don't recognize is that 95% of the day, we're in thought. And I say, well, so? I say, 
if your conscious mind is thinking, by definition, it's not paying attention to everything you're doing, walking, driving, doing your job, talking to somebody. I say, what do you mean? I say, if your conscious mind's thinking, it's on the inside looking for answers. So I say, well, then who's controlling when your mind is thinking? The answer is autopilot, subconscious. And I go, how long or how much of the day is that? 95% of the day. And the clue that we haven't paid attention to, the word subconscious, sub means below consciousness, point. 95% of the day, our conscious mind is busy thinking. Therefore, all the functions of life are now taken over by the subconscious, which is just programs. And because these programs are playing spontaneously without us paying attention, we don't even see the behavior. And that's all of a sudden you say, oh, my God, you didn't realize 95% of the day, you could be sabotaging yourself with programs you got from your family and not seeing it uh, in your, that you're doing it because your mind was busy and it didn't see that it was playing. And then all of a sudden it's like, I thought I was a victim because I really wanted this in my life and I didn't get it. So I blame the universe. And now we're saying, oh my God, no, you have that in your conscious mind, the wish and desires, but when you left the house, 95% of your life came from the programs from other people, not even your behaviors, not seeking what you're seeking, not looking for what you're looking for, other people's behavior. And I say, well, why is it relevant? If we know that, then the whole story of the matrix becomes the true story is that that we're living in a program world. We got programmed as kids and that the world we're creating is a direct expression of the program. And I don't want people to think this is like, oh, brand new idea of science. Here's a fact. The Jesuits have known this for 400 years. They've told people, people didn't even understand what they were saying. The phrase that comes from that classic time was, give me a child until it's seven and I will show you the man. And the point about that was, They were saying exactly what science just found out. Seven years is programming. Whatever program you got in the seven years, 95% of your life is going to come from that program. And therefore, whoever programs your seven years programs your life. Well, this has been known to the Jesuits, and they've been telling the public about it 400 years. I can assure you this fact of programming is not lost from those that influence how this world runs. We've all been programmed. So it's time for us to wake up. Because if we start to wake up, we can, we change it. And, and I, it's still going on. So I got one more thing to add and then we'll stop. And that is this. In the movie, The Matrix, there's an opportunity to take either the blue pill, which means you wake up and go back into the program. Life is old, back just the way it always was. Or you can take the red pill and get out of the program. And I say, well, what's the consequence of taking the red pill? And I can tell you because... When people fall in love and experience what I refer to as the honeymoon effect, where they're healthy and happy and life is all of a sudden so fabulous, even though the day before you met that person, life could have sucked, that you meet this person, it's like, oh my God, it's heaven on earth. 24 hours later, something profound happened. And here's what it is. That was the equivalent of taking the red pill because science has studied this new relationship when it starts off we stay what is called mindful. We keep our conscious mind present. We don't think as much. We're just presently living. Point is this. If you keep your conscious mind in the front, then the subconscious programs don't play. Then I say, well, then what happened in that period of life where you fell in love and it turned earth into heaven on earth? I said, it was the one time in your life you took the red pill, you stopped playing the program and look what you created, heaven on earth. That is our destination And that's why knowing about this programming is fundamentally uh, the most important thing we can do to evolve into the future. Because if we all started working with our conscious minds to create life, we would experience heaven on earth all over. And that's the conclusion. Well, Bruce, this brings up uh, an obvious question, because what you're saying here is that when we're not in our conscious mind, which we're in the conscious mind only 5% of the time on a regular basis, And then when we're in love, that's the exception to that rule. But how do we go about, now that we know this, how do we go about, or actually is the answer to try and be in the conscious mind more often throughout the day? Or are there other ways of going about this where we get in there and we reprogram that subconscious programming that's going on in the background all the time? That's that's the point. Either way will get you there. 
the honeymoon got you there because the, the, the whole experience of your heart opening up and your mind shutting down, more or less, uh, gave this opportunity to express heartfelt desires. And then when you express those consciously, mindfully, they became the world you experience. Uh, and then I said, unfortunately, the honeymoon ends because sooner or later you still have to deal with the world. And, uh, and then you start thinking when you, you know, chores, job, you know, whatever things you have to do, they start thinking. And the moment you start thinking, that's like taking the blue pill again. You went right back to the old program. The honeymoon disappears. The relationships fall apart, uh, 50% or so in divorce at least. Why? Because the person that got into the honeymoon was the person living from the conscious mind, living in wishes and desires. But at the end of the honeymoon, when it's all over, those people that got into it, are now actually behaving as other people. <laughs> They're behaving as the, the family or, or teachers they experienced in the first uh, seven years of life. Uh, so uh, that's why the honeymoon ends. So point, you want the honeymoon to go on forever, you got the two choices, as you said, stay mindful the entire time. And let me just put the caveat on that. And the answer is, boy, in this world, that's really difficult to do. We're confronted with so many things like multitasking. We're doing so many things at one time uh, that your thought processes are scattered inside your consciousness. And so, therefore, it's hard to stay mindful because our, our, we're just too engaged in thought. So mindfulness is a destination, but it's a very difficult endeavor because we're being challenged by so many things that we have to deal with. So then you come down to part two and says, well, can I change the program? And thank God you bring that up, because if you can't change the program, this would be the worst podcast that anybody's ever heard that says, hey, you know, your life sucks. It's going to always be that way. No, no, no. We can rewrite the program. And the issue about that is, is how do you rewrite the program? I said, well, you have to write the program in the same way that the subconscious learns programs. And let's eliminate one thing right away. Talking to yourself is just futile and frustrating at best for a simple reason. Because I say, well, who's talking to who? I say, well, the conscious mind is you, your spirit, your identity. And I say, oh, you're talking to the subconscious. And I say, well, who's in the subconscious? And I go, there's the problem. The subconscious is a cold machine, more or less. It records and plays back. That's all it is. So the programs in the subconscious aren't controlled, you know, made by the subconscious. They're just recorded programs. So the idea is there's nobody in there. So if you try and talk to somebody in the subconscious and ask them to make the change, you've got a problem because you might as well like talk to your uh, CD player uh, when a program is on and just talk to it and suggest that it plays something different. <laughs> Nobody's going to respond. So importantly, how does the subconscious learn? There are three fundamental ways. First is hypnosis. Well, that was the process that you learned with the first seven years you were in theta. And the relevance about that is, well, you could say, I need to go see a hypnotherapist to change a program. I say, not necessarily at all. No. Every night as you go to bed, your brain EEG is, is running at a very high vibration during the day when you're working. It's at beta vibration level high. As you calm down, dinner, calming down after dinner, relaxing, the vibrations slow down a bit. And it's now alpha, which is called calm consciousness. And just as you're nodding off, the moment consciousness, like the, somebody switched the light off I'm somewhere else at that moment, that's when you enter theta. So just as you're nodding off, you're in theta, and the next little period is theta, and then you go into a lower vibration called delta, which is absolute sleep. So relevance every night before you go to bed, as you're just going into sleep, you're in theta. And I say, well, fine. That means if I put earphones on, and play a program, you know, with the, you know, uh, they used to be called subliminal tapes. So they're like programs that can, uh, you know, enhance your desire for health or relationships or whatever problems your issue. There's tapes to, you know, put better programs in there. So simply at night, put the headphones on and listen to the program as you go to bed. Uh, you'll be sleeping anyway. It's all unconscious. Uh, your, your conscious is out. The subconscious is recording. So you do that uh, and repeat that for a bit, and you'll put a new program in. Number two, the subconscious is in hypnosis for the first seven years, but after age seven, you still do a lot of learning of programs. You, you know, driving the car, or, you know, the the alphabet, the math tables, all those things you you remember. I said, how how did you learn them and remember them? 
After age seven, you want to change the program, you create a practice, a new behavior, and you repeat it. Just like you want to drive the car, you didn't learn how to drive the car the first moment you sat in a seat. You had to go back in and try and go back in. You practice, you practice. Uh, you want to play piano, you want to play a song? At first, you don't know that song, but you practice and you play it and you play it and play it. And guess what? At some point, it becomes a program that you can play without thinking about it. I go, well, that's the issue. You want a new way of life? You practice it. <laughs> and and it's like, well, I want to be happy, and I'm not, and my world sucks, and how am I going to practice happy? And then everyone has heard the phrase, fake it till you make it. And that is, if you're not happy, pretend you're happy. Why? Because as you keep getting into that mindset and repeating it, it's becoming a habit. And that's what the subconscious mind is, the habit mind. So you create new habits by replicating a pattern. So find a pattern you want and then replicate it. And if you keep replicating, there will be a point where all of a sudden you realize you're doing the pattern without even thinking about it. And I say, oh, now it's a habit. So that's uh, the second way. First way and second way are, are time elements. You have to repeat these things a lot. The third way is magic. And third way is a new understanding called energy psychology. And in, these are modalities that enhance what is called super learning. And you say, what's super learning? I say, well, you've probably seen somebody in a bookstore read a book by turning the page and moving their finger down the page. And as fast as they move the finger down the page, they turn the page. People are, what's going on there is that they're reading the book as fast as the finger is moving down the page. So it's like swiping your finger, swiping your finger. So uh, a, a super learner can go in the bookstore uh, and in 10 or 15 minutes read the book without buying it, <laughs> yeah, just turning the pages. So if you can engage super learning, there are ways to do it. Then you can download new behaviors in matters of minutes. So uh, some of the programs that I know, uh, between five and 10 minutes of the exercise where you engage super learning, you can rewrite these programs. On my website, just so we don't have all the time, uh, there are about 20 or 30 different of these energy psychology modalities listed under belief change modalities in resources. My website's simple, brucelipton.com. And these are uh, modalities that uh, you can write new programs in five to 10 minutes. It's a miracle. And but it's a necessary miracle because uh, you've heard, uh, in, you know, invention uh, about that uh, is uh, necessity is the mother of invention. We need to do this. And it's like, yes, we're facing this big extinction problem and we all have to change the programming that we came with because that programming is the creating the behavior of our self-destruction. And our individual issues, whether it's a health issue, a love issue, a job issue, if uh, that's how you find out the program. And the program is simple. 95% of the day, just take a look. And anything you're struggling with is a reflection that you don't have a program to support that. Anything that comes easily to you, it comes easily because you have a program to encourage that. So for all of us, uh, we could take the red pill and try and get out. Or you can look at your life, see it as a printout of your program identify the struggle areas and recognize anywhere you struggle, whether it's a weight issue or a relationship issue or whatever it is, if you're struggling, the reason you're struggling is your programs do not support your destination. And since they operate 95% of the day, you can see why you have a struggle if a program doesn't uh, encourage and support your wishes and desires. So Bruce, jumping back to your first way of reprogramming there, is there a resource on your website that gives different audio that people can listen to before going to sleep? Or do you have a recommendation there? No, I actually don't because uh, this was actually a, a big deal for a while, a while back. I haven't seen much. I mean, this was back when they were called subliminal tapes. So that was uh, before even CDs. But I know that they're still out. They're just in the version of CDs. And they're in uh, any self-help bookstore kind of thing, Amazon and stuff like that. I mean, Louise Hay has a whole series of tapes. Uh, I didn't list them. But they're, they're available at, at these outlets and uh, uh, subliminal programming, uh, maybe, you know, a web search or something like that. But I know that there are different companies 
that make these very specific programs that you can just put in your player, put your earphones on. The, they always start out usually with a relaxation exercise, which is interesting because as you're going to bed and you hear the relaxation exercises and you, you just follow what they're saying. Uh, I remember the first time I heard one of these tapes, I remember, yeah, I went through all that. And then the tape started and I listened a little bit and then I was gone. It was interesting because the second time, as I started the relaxation exercises, the second time I heard the tape, I never even made it through the through to the where the tape started. I, I was already asleep by the end of the relaxation exercise. And in fact, third, fourth, and after that, I just put the tape on. As soon as it started, I was already boom. It would it would be like a sleeping pill. Just relax, and and then the tape takes over. Perfect. That's great. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners too are, you know, really primed right now with a lot of meditation and there's, there's so many resources out there, but Louise, Hey, that's a great one. So Bruce, I'm yes. going to come back to epigenetics. I know you loosely brought it up, but I really want to start by breaking that down for our audience because the word lately has been tossed around quite a bit and I don't think people really understand it. And this is a pivotal point to everything that we're talking about. Let's just describe what this is. Okay, here, let's, let's get a, what is DNA? <laughs> DNA is a, a blueprint, a molecule, like a linear string with information. It's just a code of how to make proteins. And the proteins are the physical building blocks of your body. So uh, your body is created out of 100,000 different proteins. It's sort of like you got a big Lego protein kit with 100,000 different pieces and how you assemble the pieces in different ways. You can create a muscle cell with this assembly, take it apart, reassemble it in a different way, and there's a brain cell, take that one apart, reassemble it in a different way, that's a skin cell. So we're made out of all these proteins, but to make the parts, the DNA is the blueprint. And the relevance about that, there's a code. So, uh, and it's linear code. Now, what's interesting about that is we always said the blueprints turn on and off. And it's like, well, okay, that's false. They're blueprints. They're, they're not self-actualizing. They make no decisions. They don't know what they are, who they are. We give them so much like power, like, the, I'm going to give you cancer gene. It's like, there's that no gene knows anything like that. It's just a blueprint. The issue about that is to call up the blueprints is that's where the environmental information in the blood that is sent by the brain, which is the, the picture in the mind being broken down into chemistry, and then that picture being reconstructed by the cells because that chemistry is adjusting the genes to make that picture. Uh, so epigenetics is the story that says genes aren't controlling themselves. Genes are controlled by the signals from the environment. And, and that epigenetics, the, the term epi means above. So old teaching, which I was teaching in medical school, and unfortunately, which most of the public is still uh, uh, imbued with the belief uh, that uh, genes are self-actualizing. As I said, they turn on and off. And then we go, no, they don't. Then what does? I say the signals from the environment. And I said, well, what's the new science mean? I say, when I said old science, genetic control, it means control by genes. The new science, epigenetic control, is, is like a revolution. I go, well, what does it mean? I say, epi means above. So when I say epigenetic control, I am saying control above the genes. And this is the new science. The science is signing out, oh, what are those signals from the environment and the world that are adjusting our genes? So uh, the gene activity is not controlled by the genes. It's, it's controlled by the environment. That's number one. The environment is so variable uh, that we have to sometimes change the reading of the gene because in this environment, the way the gene originally came, oh, that protein that you would make would work perfectly. In this other environment, that protein doesn't fit very well, so we have to modify that protein. I say, well, you got a blueprint. How, how do you modify it? Consider the, uh, the blueprint, uh, you know, that strip of uh, letters, which is called the DNA code, a very long strip with thousands of letters in it. I say, and what is epigenetics? Epigenetics makes a copy of the gene code, but then with like scissors and tape can cut the code, cut a piece out, invert a piece of the code with that piece. It's just like a scissors, take the strip of code, cut it into pieces and tape them back together in a different sequence. Guess what? It's a different blueprint now. Here's the point. Every gene is a blueprint, but the environmental information can cut and paste that blueprint to come out with over 3,000 to, 3, uh, to 30,000 different versions of proteins from the original blueprint. Epigenetics does not change your genetic code. 
If you're born with a mutant gene, you're going to have a mutant gene your whole life. But the question is, must you express it as a mutant gene? The answer is no, because in the right environment, I could change the, the reading of the gene with scissors and tape and make a perfectly useful protein from what was a defective gene. And so basically he says, wait a minute. So a mutant gene doesn't have to be read that way. I said, no, depending on the environment, you can alter that and make it read as a healthy gene. And I go, yeah, oh, wait a minute. Here's the bigger problem. Since almost all of us were born with healthy genes, what if you take a healthy gene and cut it up, but in, you know, do it inappropriately in a raw, you know, your wrong perception of the environment. I say, oh, well then you've created a protein now that in your mind you thought you needed, but in real life it doesn't fit. That's when disease starts. Now, so epigenetics does not change your genetic code, it just changes how you read it. And you read it based on your response to the environment. And this is so cool because in one way you may grow up and end up with cancer. And I say, well, that's because you're reading the environment that way. And I say, and what do you need to change it? Not drugs, radiation, chemotherapy. What you need to do is change how you respond to the world, because what you were doing was taking a healthy gene and using it, cutting it up in such a way as to create a mutant gene. And in fact, if you want to have health again, then you just have to let go of that perception of the world. And that's what spontaneous remissions are all about. When people are dying of cancer and all of a sudden they have a radical change uh, of the way they want to respond to the world. And they say, oh, no more. I'm not going to be stressed. The hell with this. I only got a short time left. I'm going to go out and enjoy my life. And they go out and enjoy their life. Guess what? They change the environment. They change the perception. And the cancer goes away. It's like, wow. And they call it a miracle. I say, it's not a miracle. It's epigenetics. Epigenetics is how you take your vision of the world and uh, cut and splice your genes to manufacture a physical expression that is a complement to the way you see the world. And when I say you see the world, I have to go back and remind people, well, you see the world with two different minds. You see the world through your conscious mind where you see all the wonderful wishes and desires and things that you would really like. And your subconscious mind is looking at the world to make the program that you have express itself. And so when you get cancer, it wasn't your conscious mind thinking, hey, consciously, I would love to have cancer. No, the conscious mind is like horrified. <laughs> but I said the conscious mind's only working 5% of the time. You got a program like that adopted kid that came into a family where there was cancer running in it, which was a program. The adopted kid gets the program and then gets the cancer. So the whole idea about this is epigenetics is this mastery science, meaning what? You are not a victim of genes. You could come with mutant genes and still have a healthy life. Why? Because you adjust the reading of the genes with epigenetics. So you get a genetic code, but how that code is expressed is not the action of the gene. It's the action of epigenetics, how your perception is going to release chemistry to alter the genes to match your perception. And that all of a sudden says, well, my God, then I'm the one that can change the environment. I'm the one that can change my perception. Therefore, I'm the one that controls my genetics. I go, absolutely. And that's the beautiful part. If you become aware of this and you start to see your life is not working in harmony, your health is not in harmony. It's like before you go out and blame all the genes on this, it turns out genes have less than 1% of the cause. The cause is us. And then we go back to that uh Take care of, you know, cleaning up your own backyard before cleaning up the world. We have to clean up the way we respond, the programs that we came with, and free ourselves of self-imposed program. But we didn't impose it intentionally. It was downloaded by being brought up in a, in a family, in a community, which determined what the download was. And, and therefore, we can't blame ourselves for cancer and things like that. Our conscious mind didn't create that. It came from the programming. All we have to do is not blame anybody and just say, wait, I have an issue with my life, behavioral, emotional, uh, health-wise. I can change it. And that's where we start to take care of that backyard. And that's when all of a sudden we have mastery. And the same mastery that created the honeymoon effect is the mastery that can turn the whole planet into heaven on earth.
Bruce, I'd like to connect your work, the new science to the old science in a different way here, talking about your work here, the positive belief having a positive influence on our health. It sounds a lot like the placebo effect in science where somebody takes, say, a sugar pill and they're expecting a certain result from that pill. And because they have that belief, they get that outcome, even though the chemistry of that pill obviously isn't what made that change. So can you just talk a little bit about that connection? Yes, and I thank you for bringing that up. Really, Jesse, that's real important because that is the working example of epigenetics. That is how it works. And then I I have to say, why is this important? Because when we talk about the placebo effect, it's about how somebody who has, uh, you know, some kind of illness whose belief has changed, the picture in their mind has changed, they can see themselves taking this pill, and the result of taking this picture in their perception, the mind is, oh, I am a healthy person. And so the pill didn't heal them, it was the picture, I am a healthy person. Now, why is that important? Well, firstly, from one-third to two-thirds of all medical healing, including surgery, is actually the consequence of the placebo effect. And everybody goes, yeah, I know that's kind of placebo positive thinking. And I go, oh, wait, what you didn't recognize, because we don't talk about it as something as important, perhaps more important, and that is this. Placebo effect is the consequence of having a positive belief about the outcome of what's going on. What if you have a negative belief about something? And all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, a negative belief is equally powerful in creating reality as a positive belief, but it works in the opposite direction. There's actually a name for it in science. Not many people know of it. It's called the nocebo effect. The nocebo effect is if you have a a belief that you have an illness or a disease, you can manifest it by just having the belief. You can have cancer if you believe you have cancer. You, You can die if you believe I'm going to die. <laughs> and this is so critical because we, you know, sloughed off the idea that, oh, negative beliefs are always happening. Yeah, stop and listen. 70% or more of your conversation is going to be negative. This isn't going to happen. That won't work. Oh, that'll never happen. These are the thoughts going through. And I say, well, why is it relevant? The function of the mind is to take those thoughts and turn them into reality via epigenetics or behavioral control. And all of a sudden I say, My God, we've only talked about the influence of positive thinking, and we left out the more pervasive negative thinking, which is equally powerful. It's the opposite influence uh, of the placebo thinking. It's the negative thinking, and we manifest our world with negative thinking. And as I said, just as much as placebo works, nocebo works equally with the same power. Wow, Bruce, we've covered so much and every little bit of it was unbelievable. So thank you so much. And before we totally wrap up, what we want to do is get into a rapid fire question round and get to know you a little bit better as a person. Sound good? Are there are there prizes? Do I win something? Okay, let's do it. <laughs> for, sure, for sure. We'll ship you something over over where you are. <laughs> okay. So the first one, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Uh, the best piece of advice was, uh, by my, uh, the guy who trained me, my, my major professor in, in my graduate training on how to clone stem cells. And we would put the cells in a Petri dish and I'd put them in an incubator. And the most important thing he said, which turned out to be the whole meaning of everything. Uh, he said, if you take the dish out tomorrow morning and the cells don't look good, don't blame the cells, look at the environment. And it ends up without even knowing what we were talking about at that point, that is exactly the the nature of the new science. Uh, stop blaming w- what's inside. Just see how we are responding to the environment. Uh, so, and that's where all the power comes from. Right on. And what drives you? Love, harmony, peace. Whatever, if you've ever touched love and you had something touchy called the honeymoon effect where everything was so great, everything was yesterday, the same thing wasn't so beautiful. Today, it's really beautiful. And that's like, this is the drive force because once I started to remove those subconscious programs that looked at the world in less than a beautiful way and replace them with beautiful programs, 
And now I have the honeymoon every day of my life. It doesn't mean everything I want happens. But when things don't happen, they don't also undermine who I am. I don't really care. I am in love. I'm in love with life. And the most important thing is I had to learn, and I believe it is the most important thing every one of us must learn first, is to love ourselves. If you can't love yourself, then you cannot be loved. And that's a simple reason why. If I don't love myself and you say you love me, then I must look at you and go, well, boy, you have no quality control. I mean, I'm not lovable. I know that. What, what's wrong with you? So until we learn to love ourselves, every other bit of life is is held in abeyance until we jump over that. And that's to me is if we're going to go out and learn one thing is must learn to love yourself. And the reason why we have to work on it is because of the critical way we were programmed. We were programmed being, by being, having people being, uh, you know, ex- looking at our, as critically, like, oh, that's not good enough. That's not, you could do better. You, you, this is not the way you should be. All of these critical things being recorded in our subconscious mind, playing 95% of the day, assure us that we are super hypercritical of ourselves and, and that debases the love and the power of who we really are. Such an important point being made and a whole other show could be talked about it. And we plan yes. having you back talking about the honeymoon of I love it. Other book, which is sitting I unopened. Love it. We're dying to get into it, but we had to hold out because we want to do this podcast again with you talking about the honeymoon effect. But I I would love you guys to read it and, and I would suggest really, really uh, to read it together or alternately at the same time. Because it it really does a disservice when one in a couple reads it and says, ah, I got the whole story and I understand. And the other person's like, yeah, right. Until both of them are on the same page, uh, there's a miscommunication. And that's, that's so that's a little caveat. Uh, it's a book to understand how we got into the honeymoon, how it works on our biology, and more importantly, how come we lose it and what we can do to keep it. Uh, and as I said, If both partners are reading it, then they're both at the same place and they understand it. And that's far better than one knowing and the other not. 100%. So that's our plan and we will have you back on. I hope so. Oh, yeah, for sure. Next question. What's one thing most people don't know about you? I'm a very simple guy. (laughs) People think, oh, that guy's really smart or something. He's like, no, no, no. Just a simple, happy guy. And, And I love simple things. So... Peace is easy for me. Love it. Okay, Bruce, what is the greatest challenge you've ever faced and how did you overcome it? (laughs) Well, there are so many of them. It's hard to pick which one it would be. Uh, The greatest challenge, actually, which is it was so it was so undermining. It was devastating was when I started to understand the new biology, I completely got out of the uh, the community because everybody in my community was focusing on genes controlling life. And I'm this weirdo on the outside saying, no, genes aren't doing that. Genes aren't doing that. And I was the only one. And I remember I, I went back to the University of Wisconsin where I was a professor and I left because uh, I couldn't continue teaching with what I knew. And I came back because I just thought, you know, I need to have a scientific audience just to assess uh, my new ideas. So I went and gave this lecture and the room was filled up with all my colleagues and there's a long story, but the bottom line, I get to the end and they're all staring at me with saucer-like eyes. And I say, thank you very much. And nothing. The room was dead still. You could hear a pin drop in the room. They just sat there looking at me. Nobody moved. And then all of a sudden, one person in the back of the room started to clap twice. I remember he clapped and as soon as he did that, everybody else in the room looked at that person and he put his hands down, stopped clapping. And then like an invisible conductor, they all got up and they walked out. And there was this moment I thought, am I crazy? Because crazy people surely believe so much in what they do that it's so right. And I went in there with all this great enthusiasm, like a crazy person, and went in there and gave them this message. And they all walked out on me. Not one person had stayed. Not one person asked me a question. They just left like, uh, you know, escape or something. And there was a moment of, oh, my God, I might be crazy. And I had to go back and... and um, uh, I went back to meet with a lot of scientists before I was able to come to, you know, the conclusion that was offered. My hypothesis, they said, was too simple. 
And what was interesting about that is there's a phrase in uh, a thing you learn in biology called Occam's razor. And that is the simplest hypothesis is the most likely one and should be considered before all others. The fact that they couldn't say anything wrong, there was like I said, tell me what's wrong with the model I'm pro proposing. Nobody could find anything wrong. They just said it's not the way we're thinking. I said, well, I, that's pretty clear. But then I started to realize there was nothing that any scientist could tell me that was wrong with the whole thing that I was promoting. And that was that was a long time ago, you know, uh, 1985 or so. And then I had to make a stand and say, I believe I'm right and I'm going to stick to this. And within 10 years, uh, science uh, recognized it as the new science called epigenetics. So the first part was devastating. I'm a crazy human. The resolution was I can't find anything wrong with it, so I'm just going to stick to my beliefs and sticking to it and continuing with it and then finding out that it was right is like, that was good. Not only <laughs> right, but now you're a pioneer. So kudos to you. <laughs> Thank you. You're but, welcome. Uh, but, you know, I have to tell you the truth uh, is applying it to my own life was the most important piece of everything. Uh, I remember when I first got this information and and I wanted to talk to people and I try to get them to come and let me tell them, explain how this mechanism works. Uh, and I get in there and I go through the science. I say, if you understand what I'm talking about, you can have the most beautiful life. And they'd look at me and cock their heads and look at me and go, you know, Lipton, your life doesn't look that great for a guy who says you know this stuff. And that was a wake up call that I said, wait, how come I know all this stuff and my life is not changed. I'm I have all this knowledge and, and I'm still living the same old life with all the same problems. And that was the wake up call that I said, oh my God, my conscious mind, which has all this knowledge and all of our conscious minds are now sharing this knowledge, is not the same mind as a subconscious mind, which is the more powerful and prevalent mind. So here I am with all this awareness and my life sucks. And it was like, oh, until I make it part of my subconscious programming, uh, I have a conflict. Uh, I can have all this knowledge, but 5% of the day where I could use it is not enough to create that life. I had to go back and get my subconscious programs in alignment. And as soon as I did that, I've had um, a honeymoon. I don't know if we'll go your whole life. It's 23 years right now, and it's still a honeymoon. You know, I mean, it's juicy and loving and all that. Why? Because it's a habit. <laughs> it's like, well, that's a great habit. I'm going to stick with this one. You rebuilt a new you. <laughs> I did. And we all should do that. That's what the point is. Look at your life, find your struggle, and recognize it's not a struggle being imposed from the outside. It's an unconscious struggle being created from the inside. Because then you become a powerful human because you say, well, I can fix that. And you do. And there you go. I got another question for you. What's the biggest lesson that you've learned yes. the last year? I can't think of the biggest lesson. It's just that uh, I'm still here <laughs> and I'm still enjoying it. And uh, and uh, uh, the shock, I was shocked politically. Uh, and yet at the same time, it was a dual shock. At one level, it was like, oh, my God, what are we doing? And on the other level, it says, I know what we're doing and we need it. So hold on. <laughs> Well, Bruce, you've shared so much great information throughout this show. Our listeners are just going to love it. But what is one thing the listeners can take away, apply to their healthy routine right after the show, something that can help them reach ultimate health? When I talk about the fact that our consciousness is shaping our biology, I'm talking to you about the fact of a biological mechanism, cells, chemistry, genes, all, all that, that. That's all coordinated and making sense. But I want people to understand this is not just an idea. It's the whole foundation of the universe. And I said, what do you mean? I say, quantum physics is an understanding of the mechanisms of the universe. Physics means mechanics, mechanisms, the physical things. So uh, when we talk about Newtonian physics, there's a, uh, a belief that we all were programmed with and live in, and that is there's two realms. There's the physical realm, that matter, that we can see and touch, and then there's an invisible realm, uh, like the energy that's being broadcast from uh, this podcast. Uh, and we say, oh, the two separate realms. Quantum physics put them together and say they're not separate realms. In fact, Everything that you perceive as physical, if you take it apart and look inside with something that you call an atom, you say, what is an atom made out of? You say, well, small particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons. And I go, what are they made out of? 
And that's when quantum physics became a science because when they went in and understand what are the particles made out of, they're not made out of particles, they're made out of energy. <laughs> what that means is everything that you see as matter is just another form of energy. The whole universe is energy and that there's a connectivity. But the most important fact is quantum physicists recognize that the physical expression of the universe is totally an expression of our consciousness. If we change our consciousness, we change the world, and collectively, we are changing the universe. And, and so it is a law of physics that consciousness is the foundation of reality. Uh, I can't remember w which of the physicists, I think it might have been Eddington, uh, the, the, the quote was, uh, we perceive of the world as a great machine, but in truth, it's really just a great thought. And so why is this relevant? Well, I can talk about the biology that your consciousness is creating in your life, but I want everybody to understand this is greater than biology. Quantum physics is the most validated science that ever existed on this planet. And the root and core of it is that it's an energy universe and that our consciousness as part of that energy is giving shape to us and the world around us. Now, I've been talking about just the biology and the chemistry and the genes and all that. Physics goes even deeper and just says, your consciousness is creating this. So the conclusion, when it comes down to the very bottom line, if we are creating with this consciousness, what if we change our consciousness? What if we stop being the victims? What if we start taking the power in of creating heaven on earth? The answer is if we're creating this, then the earth becomes heaven on earth. And so it's giving back to us as individuals. This is a participatory evolution. This is not an evolution. You sit in your easy chair and you open up your curtains one day and go, wow, the world just evolved. I go, no, no. All of us are creators. We're creating our personal worlds and collectively we're creating the world we all experience. It is a wake up call for us. Consciousness. I provide a biological insight. Quantum mechanics provides the energetic insight. It's still the same conclusion. We can make heaven on earth. That is our charge. That is we can help this planet recover by letting go of our old consciousness and programming love and harmony and peace and beauty and all those wonderful words that we love and put that into the subconscious and then lo and behold, we are there. And so uh, my greatest hope uh, is for people to recognize that. And, and then the benefit is even before the whole world turns into heaven on earth, if you as an individual do it, your world will turn into heaven on earth. And that's, that's the destination I've been doing. As I said, 23 years, it's been working wonderfully. Uh, I suggest that it's a, it's a good practice. What an empowering, positive way to end Bruce. Thank you so much. And our listeners, if you guys haven't gotten a copy of The Biology of Belief, Bruce's book that we've based this conversation around, definitely be sure to get a copy. It's fantastic, and there's just so much more in there than we were able to cover on today's show, so it'll blow your mind. And Bruce, how else can our listeners connect with you after the show? Well, just basically, uh, there's um, um, social media connections as well as actually my website, which has lots of information on it that you can freely download, listen to, watch, etc., to uh, support the things that we've been talking about. Fantastic. And we're going to link everything up over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 142. So listeners, go there, check out the show notes. There's going to be a nice summary and links to everything we discussed. Bruce, again, thank you so much. This has been fabulous. And uh, we can't wait to have you back on again down the line. I so appreciate you both, Jesse, Marnie, for all this opportunity to talk to people. And I also want to express my appreciation to everyone that's listening, because if you're listening to this program, you are now in a situation to become a cultural creative. The cultural creatives are the individuals that will change the world. And since you're listening to this program and listening to ideas that Jesse and Marnie have been uh, giving you over this time period, not just this broadcast, uh, recognize they're, they're opening doors for your empowerment. And so so I appreciate you as the cultural creatives and uh, Jesse and Marnie, thank you for uh, opening up the uh, light on all of this. Thank you. You're so welcome and thank you. Take care, Bruce. Bye. 
I have to say, this is probably one of my favorite conversations to date, and you can just hear Bruce's energy, his enthusiasm for life. You can't help but walk away from this episode feeling so good. We hope you guys loved it. As always, we want to hear what you think. So come on over to our Facebook group, ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash community. This is our community. You'll see if you have been joined in the group for a long time, you'll see that we changed the title to Ultimate Health Community. So we want to create this awesome space where we can share ideas, not only about the podcast, but about life. We'll see you guys over on Facebook. Have a fantastic week. Take care.